here with Liz Young from SoFi. Guy is off today, which is why we're not introducing Liz as EY from SoFi. Hi, Liz. How are you? Hi. We get to use my regular name. I love it. Yeah. Yeah, the one that you were kind of brought up with, you know, that yeah. sort of thing. That yeah, people that one. Call well, you Lizzie, every day. maybe Lizzie then. You'd have to call me well, Lizzie. Well, listen, you know, and I, I just want to just, that. I want to kind of lay this out right here. It seems like every time that I am off and it's just you and Guy, you guys talk about how much fun you have here. <laughs> we're going to have some fun today. So stick around, people. Today's episode of Market Call is brought to you by FactSet Financial Data and Analytics, powered by Tomorrow. And of course, SoFi, get your money right all in one app, which is what you do every day, Liz. That is the life that you lead. And of course, we are powered uh, by Open Exchange here. So again, hey, Liz, real quickly. So Guy is not off today. That was in uh, the little note here. Guy has spent the night in a small airport in Virginia after being diverted last night because of the storms yeah. in the Northeast. And he is not happy. I, I think yeah. he Really, I mean, him. I feel I feel for him. And you guys know I used to travel all the time. I used yeah. to be I say this all the time. Wheels up on Monday, wheels down on Thursday. Yeah. I got diverted once to Baltimore and I was so desperate to get home because it was midnight that I yeah. took an Uber home with a stranger. Wow. <laughs> all the way from Baltimore to New York City at midnight. We started yeah. at midnight. We got home about 3 30 a.m. But I made it. Well, well, <laughs> com coming home, this could be like a theme of next week's SoFi investing blog for you because sometimes you'll do whatever it takes to get home. And I think this is really interesting. Here's the segue. Microsoft, this morning, this is a company that reported their fiscal Q3 results, what, a little less than two months ago or so. They gave guidance for the current quarter. They opened today's trading with a negative pre-announcement. I think it's really interesting. You know, negative pre-announcements, so inter-quarter, these are not something you see a whole Whole heck of a lot right so a lot of companies there's certain guidelines about if your prior guidance um is going to be within you know outside of a certain bracket then you come out you pre-announce this was not a big guide down liz and they're talking about you know the, the the strength of the u.s dollar hitting their earnings but they also guided revenues um a little bit lower i'm just curious when you saw that we've been talking about the potential for this for weeks now we thought it was very likely not because of fx but but really because of softening demand and a likely weaker corporate environment as it relates to spending. I'm just curious, what were your initial reactions? The stock was down 4%, now it's down less than 1%. Well, I, I mean, I got to give you guys props first, because I think you were the first ones to say yeah. earnings expectations are just still way too high. This can't be right for the rest of the year. And some of the stuff that came in about retail a couple of weeks ago, so when we heard from Target and Walmart, that made sense to me because it sounded like the consumer had sort of shifted their patterns. They were citing a lot of the pressures that we all know are out there, inflation, wage costs, and so on and so forth. And they had inventory problems, right? This one was interesting because they didn't use the regular excuses of inflation. They didn't use the excuse of the Ukraine-Russia war. Yeah. They ended up using the dollar. And yes, it's all interconnected. I understand that. But I thought it was an interesting explanation. And you're right. They didn't guide down that much. It was only about, if you use the midpoint of their range, only about one and a half, two percent 2%. But it could come down further. And look, this might be one of the first companies we hear about in this particular group, but it won't be the last. Yeah, I mean, more importantly, it's one of the biggest companies in the world. You know, by market cap, it was over $2 trillion, And you think about that revenue base and you think about that balance sheet and that kind of just that earnings growth and the cash flow generation this company has, you know, if they're one of the first to come out, I would just say this is that they did not have to guide lower. They did not have to negatively pre-announce. But I suspect that they're probably getting ready for the full fiscal year. This is their Q4. So when they report next month that they probably didn't want to actually not get the street or investors ready for what would have been a Q4 miss and then potentially mm -hmm. a guide lower for the current quarter, which would be Q1 and then the full year. So they might yeah. be piecing it out. And let me tell you, they did it well because it didn't hit the market really hard. The stock's doing okay here. So I think that's something that's worth noting. Um, I want to go into this. Usually we do John Butters, um, who's a uh, fact size earnings insight um, specialist analyst. He has a great report that comes out every Friday. He gives us a preview of it. 
on Thursdays. You can get his um, his newsletter um, by just uh, subscribing to FactSet Earnings Insight. Just Google Butters there. Go to FactSet.com. Um, but he had a note out, or the note that's coming out. He's talking about actually this very thing. So it came out before the Microsoft cut, but he was talking about analyst cut earnings estimates for S&P 500 companies for Q2 by only 1.1% during the first two months of the quarter. So I think that's really interesting. What he's saying is that analysts are really not getting out in front of this, as we just kind of talked about here. So, you know, he's just kind of suggesting that these sorts of cuts are probably pretty minimal, but they're likely to pick up. And I think a report like this or a pre-announcement like this from a company like Microsoft could get analysts kind of moving their feet a little bit. And then by sector level, I thought this was kind of interesting, and maybe you have some comments here. The consumer discretionary sector saw the largest decrease in these EPS estimates for Q2. And for the full calendar year, other than that energy saw the largest increase and i think you're probably on board for both of those yeah so i'd make a couple points here first of all all we're talking about in this note is q2 q2 earnings estimates weren't really all that frothy to begin with they they were four something percent now i think they're about five percent it's that q3 q4 estimate both in the 10 percent range that seem a little bit outrageous the other thing i would say is if you look at the stock price reaction two days after earnings releases after what happened in the first quarter Companies that missed were punished by about 6% yeah. on average. Companies that beat were only up 0.2%. So I think Microsoft did it right by getting ahead of that, saying, you know what, let's let the market react now rather than react later in real time because we know that they're punishing this so much. On the point of consumer discretionary, I think they still have to come down even further. And the reason that it happened in the second quarter more than other quarters is because I think I made this point last week. Oh, I don't know if you were there, but you'll hear it now, that consumers can change their minds really quickly. Yeah. We can change our minds today about what we're going to spend tomorrow, but the company that's affected by that isn't going to tell us about it until the following quarter. So I think consumer discretionary names are right to guide down. I think they need to do it for the third and fourth quarter as well and just get ready for that. Yeah, that's that's an important point. And that's what our takeaway was from those Walmart and Target reports, too, because those are two very big retailers. And when they're talking about the sort of ticket items um, that, you know, that get sold in their stores, basically they're talking about inflation at the pump and inflation of food is really kind of eating into their carts, if you will, here. Um, so I think that consumers will get a little bit more cautious if we continue to see elevated energy levels here. All right, Liz. If people watch this show, they also know that you are a prolific tweeter. You are at Liz Young Strat on the Twitter here. And you had a couple interesting tweets. This is one that I saw that caught my eye. The five major regional Fed surveys are pointing to a pretty sharp slowdown in May. The average dip below zero. First time it's been negative since 2020. We know what happened then. This has been negative without a recession before. This has uh, but you're saying, uh, but it could be the case again. Talk to me a little bit about this, because this is where we're getting at. I kind of think the Microsoft thing could be the tip of the iceberg. And if we do have a slowing economy into the summer here, this is how you probably get this thing to snowball a little bit. But that's also the thing mm -hmm. we've been saying for capitulation in this market. We need to see analysts, strategists, companies come down and guide lower and get estimates low enough where the valuations look reasonable enough. And so if this sort of indicator is kind of putting your antennas up, just talk to me a little bit about this and why this caught your eye. Yeah, so for everybody watching out there who doesn't have a Bloomberg terminal and can compare all of these different indicators at the same time, there are so many different things that give us a read on manufacturing activity. There are a bunch of different indicators for the labor market and you try to square them all together. Usually when I look at these regional Fed surveys, they're so lumpy and you could have a completely different read in New York versus a different part of the country. And you know something like Richmond, Virginia, for example, I think that was the biggest miss last month. And I, when my analyst told me about it, I said, okay, well, yeah, no offense to anybody in, who's watching in Richmond, Virginia, but I said Richmond, Virginia doesn't represent the entire country. So we need the aggregate to look like it's going down. And in this particular one on that chart, what you see is that the aggregate is going down, meaning that it's now a consistent trend across all of the regions. The part that hasn't broken yet though is broad manufacturing PMI, which is just an aggregate measure, that's still showing in expansionary territory. So to your point, some of those other bigger indicators, the ones that are more headline makers than this regional stuff still need to fall probably considerably below where they are before we can feel like, okay, that's enough. 
And now we can start to level out, but I, it's still going to take a while. It's still going to take some time. Yeah. So you had a tweet yesterday that also caught my eye. The 10 year U.S. Treasury yield surging on the back of new economic data, despite recent growth concerns, job openings, ISM manufacturing data came in above estimates. Markets once again reminded us that the Fed has wood to chop. You saw the 10 year U.S. Treasury yield above 2.9 percent. It's still up there. It got as low as I think 2.8 percent. I think your point is hot data is going to remind everybody that the Fed is going to continue to stay their course. Yeah, I think I think we got a little bit excited that there was slowing data happening. So it meant that the Fed was going to immediately turn dovish, which is absolutely not the case. We still have inflation over 8%. And I've been making this point, which is a nuanced point. I've been making it on CNBC for the last few weeks. I do think at some point the Fed takes their foot off that tightening gas pedal a little bit, and it's going to feel dovish, but it's not going to actually be a dovish move. It's just going to be that it's not quite as aggressive as we thought. So maybe instead of getting to 3% by the end of the year, they only get to 2.5% by the end of the year. But the point is, they're still going to get there. They still have to raise in order to control the issues. And I don't see the labor market slowing down anytime soon. I also think that they're hoping that things like job openings just get reduced reduced rather than seeing a big rise in unemployment. So everybody's still sitting here crossing their fingers that we can make this happen. The market's problem, and I think this is going to continue to be the market's problem through June, maybe even early July, is that we can't decide what's good news and what's bad news anymore, right? And every single day we have this big whipsaw back and forth. I said this a few weeks ago, you feel like you're wrong on any given day. Yesterday was a completely different sentiment than today was because every single piece of data that we get in, we're trying to interpret and decide what the Fed is going to do with it. So I don't think that gets resolved until we find out a few more times what the Fed actually does. So we need another couple meetings. We need another couple CPI reports. Yeah, well, you know, the the Fed vice chair, Lael Brainerd, kind of agrees with you on that whole kind of wood to chop thing. Um, And she made the comment on CNBC earlier today, very hard to see the case the Fed pushing out rate hikes here. And I think this is interesting. You know, you use a different system to to do a lot of comparative data. I use FactSet here. Look at this beautiful FactSet chart um, that we have here showing the 10-year yield over the last five years. And we almost got to those 2018 highs. And we know what the Fed did the last time that the 10-year U.S. Treasury yield got to about three and a quarter percent. Well, they pivoted. And you saw what happened to rates. And obviously, rates were going down before the pandemic. Why? The, the, The economy was already starting to weaken back then. People kind of forget that. And that's one of the reasons why in 2018, we had the scare and the the growth scare and the Fed had to pivot here a little bit. So to me, it'll be really interesting until we see the 10 year meaningfully above that 2018 high and breaking that 30, 35 year downtrend. uh, I'm not convinced that we're going to see this huge rip in yields. And if we do have the data come in kind of hard and we don't have that soft landing that I know a lot of people are hoping for, then you're going to see yields come in, in my opinion, and you're going to see risk assets suffer, suffer a little bit. Before we get to your note that's out today in the SoFi Investing blog, let's talk about the S&P 500 here because I've been saying this, Guy is in being in agreement with me. We've seen a lot of stocks, you know, round trip those pre-pandemic moves, um, a lot of sectors, uh, Liz. And if you look at this S&P 500, you know, we've had this nice little bounce off those lows from about a week and a half ago or so. But man, we are not out of the woods. We are still in a downtrend. Mm-hmm. I think the potential for a move back towards 34 or 30 3,500, and I'll do a little math. We've been doing it on the market call. If you want to put 5% earnings growth, and just so you know, again, you know, refreshing what we just talked about, one of the largest companies in the world just guided the quarter down. Maybe they're inching out uh, or eking out that news, but if we're going to see a handful of those companies start to lower their guidance, you're going to see S&P earnings come down to about, I don't know, low single digits, mid single digits, growth, put a 17 multiple, that's the 10-year average, that gets you to that 3,400-ish sort of level. Talk to me, though, on the NASDAQ here, because, again, you know, today's price actions by some of the big tech stocks does not indicate that we are likely to see a bunch of other these companies and, uh, you know, do the same. At the lows, the NDX, the NASDAQ 100, was down 30 percent two weeks ago, Liz. Are you thinking about before we get to the S&P again, we're going to dive a little deeper. What about the NASDAQ versus the S&P 500? Those same five names that you want to focus on, they make Mm -hmm. up 25 percent of the S&P 500. They make up nearly 40% or a little more of the NASDAQ 100. I think if the S&P goes down further, the NASDAQ goes down even further than that. And another little thing I would point out to everybody is that the, the quick math that you did, which was impressive, 
in your yeah. head. Yeah. The quick math that you did is using a 17 times multiple. I, it could go lower than that. So you use that same earnings math and yeah. put a 16 and a half multiple on it, right? Then think about where the S&P target is. For the NASDAQ, look, here's something really interesting. If you look at, see, this is another one of those indicators that not everybody knows about, yeah. challenger job cuts. If you look at industries like tech and communications, even fintech, you're seeing some softness in the labor market in those industries, the ones that have gotten hit hardest. Yep. So I think that there's gonna be a lot more industries that guide down through the rest of the year as they should. And they're going to continue to get hit hard by labor costs. I mean, just anecdotally, I'm trying to hire somebody right now and it is tough. There are a yeah. ton of applicants, but there is a really tough labor market out there. Every single one of them is in the in the ring for five other jobs, right? And they're yep. getting good offers. So that is not calming down anytime soon. I think the NASDAQ gets hit harder by that environment. Yeah, no, it, it's interesting you mentioned that. I think that, you know, the, the challenger jobs data, I think we're starting to see this just this morning. We saw Gemini, which is a big crypto exchange. They just announced they're going to do a 10% uh, jobs cut. The two founders of that company, the Winklevi guys, they said we are in a crypto, <laughs> but they said we're in a crypto winter. I mean, they're just, they're coming out and saying yeah. it. Coinbase has already cut. We know that a lot of fintechs are going to be cutting. These are the, some of the frothiest areas of the job market and we're also going to see wage growth come in and if wage growth starts to come in as we see inflation eating up right we're seeing savings rates going down we're seeing consumer credit go up i mean that's not a great setup if we do have a softening economy which is why i don't really believe the feds can be successful um, with a soft landing one thing i wanted to check in really quickly Look at the Russell 2000 the ETF that tracks it, the IWN and uh, IWM. And you just heard me say, so small cap stocks have basically round trip that entire move right back to the pre-pandemic highs. What does that say to you? We know that they were very credit sensitive, right? So when rates started going higher, um, obviously mm -hmm. not a lot of overseas exposure. So not the same dollar issues here. Do you think, and, and I'm just pulling this one up because to me it would make perfect sense that the S&P 500 would come back and round trip that whole move. But it also makes sense to me, Liz, even though that the Russell has bounced off of that level, which was the prior high, right? If it goes through there, you better watch out because I think the S&P and the NASDAQ are gonna fall suit. Do you do you talk about the Russell on days when I'm not here, or do you just do it to torture me so that no, I have to we, see? We do. I, I mean, but you know what the funny? I made a call funny... for it and then watch the chart just fall yeah, you, out you, of bed. Hey, hey, Liz, 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 you also <laughs> you also changed your mind uh, on that call too. Which, <laughs> I did. Which I did. You do reserve the right to yes. do, and you yes. know, you know, you don't look at the same things that Guy and I do. Like we're the fast money guys. You're the investment committee gal. Uh, uh, you know, from the halftime report here. <laughs> you know, we look at a lot of technicals. We look at a lot of sentiment stuff we look at you know stuff like that and to us that breakout in the fall it's inability to stick you know what i mean i mean yeah. i think once you saw it break to the downside that long consolidation and that was probably in december you were out uh, i mean yeah. let, let's be very frank on that yeah that's fair okay so a couple of things i would say about small caps in this environment first of all if we do avert recession and start to feel like we are actually mid cycle instead of late cycle, small caps absolutely should bounce. And I do like the amount that they've already corrected by because to your point, they are insulated from some of that multinational headwind that the bigger companies are going to see. So that is a, a big thing in their favor. Uh, the other thing I would say, and I, I heard this, somebody else made this point, so I can't take credit for it, but I thought it was really interesting that Large cap companies this year, you've seen a ton of buybacks already, and I think that that continues through the end of the year. Larger cap companies also have plenty of cash on their balance sheets to do that, right? Small cap companies don't have that. So some of the drawdowns that we've seen in large cap have been truncated to some degree by buybacks and by insider buying that small cap companies just don't have the cash to operate in. So there's a chance that small caps have seen their worst day at this point, and now they just kind of trade around in a range with the rest of the market. But if and when we find out that we didn't actually go into a recession, or maybe the Fed doesn't have to get to 3% by the end of the year, I think small caps could see a nice bounce. If you want to be really specific about it, though, if I was going to buy small caps today, let's be serious, add to my small cap position. Yeah. If I was going to do that today, I would do it in small cap value.
Yeah, no, that makes sense. And I, I mean, the value is apparent there. And especially if they've t- taken their licks right now and, and are able to kind of, um, you know, at least from like in your value scans, kind of just continue to screen that way. I think you probably will see them lead to the upside. That would be my take, too. So, again, that's why we wanted to bring it up. All right, real quickly, let's hit your note um, from this morning, because you're talking about casting a wider net. This is on the SoFi.com slash blog. You can get it every Thursday. Uh, Liz writes it up this one was a good one this is like near and dear to my heart i know you love uh small caps i love focusing on the concentration of a handful of names in the s p 500 but your note took some time to kind of really break it apart here because the equal weight s p which you think is very important to look at because a lot of times we get bogged down with those half a dozen names or so talk to me a little bit about what you're thinking about in this note today well, first of all, I'm sad that Guy is missing this one because you saw the picture. I did this as an entire fishing theme because I spent my Memorial Day weekend on a fishing boat and I caught a 50 pound striped bass Beautiful over the fish. weekend. Wow. So this is all an ode to my fish. We had to put the fish back in the water. She's fine. She's on her merry way. But anyway, that's the theme of this piece. Okay. So what I wanted to do here though, was because we, we went from trying to call a bottom to trying to call a peak in inflation, to then just trying to call bear market rallies. And when does a bear market rally start and when does it stop? And are these actually bear market rallies or are they going somewhere? So I'm looking at three different things that are telling me whether or not some of these little rallies, and we've only, honestly, we've only had three that have lasted more than three days this year, which is just sad, but this has been the worst start to a year since 1970. So looking at those little rallies, and trying to decide which one I start to feel more confident in and what indicators am I looking at to figure out whether or not we're actually at an inflection point to move to the upside. So the S&P equal weight index is always something that's interesting to look at versus the market cap. There's not, there. I should say there are times when it doesn't matter that much. In this particular instance, I think it matters a lot and here's why. The biggest five names in the S&P make up almost 25% of the index, and they're the ones we all know and love, right? Apple, Amazon, you name it, all those big five. If you look at the rest of the index, those are the ones, especially those are the sectors that I think are going to have to get us out of this. Because going into a tightening cycle, tech is probably not the thing that's going to get us out of this market correction. So we need the other sectors to carry their weight. So if you look at the S&P equal weighted index, you want to see it outperforming because what that tells me is that the other stocks, not the big ones that are getting hit by this, are actually doing some good work under the surface. And that is the case. You're seeing the equal weight outperform the market cap weighted index so far this year. There are a couple other indicators that I've been looking at. If you look at just the performance that's happened during those little bounces, The first couple bounces, you saw the NASDAQ way outperform the S&P and you saw the market cap weight completely outperform the equal weight, which again tells you, okay, that was led by tech, that was led by big cap names. When you get into this last bounce, it was that last week in May, they all performed exactly the same. Mm -hmm. And that is what I want to see. I want to see that the average stock, the other sectors are actually carrying their weight. We're not there yet, but I think we're trying really, really hard to get there. And I'm hopeful that by midsummer, we can actually make a little bit more headway. Yeah, and I think that's a really important dynamic. You've heard me talk about the QQQ, and that's what I've been kind of dollar cost averaging in over the last few weeks or so, because I actually will tell you that I do think that big cap tech will lead us out. I mean, that's kind of my personal view, because I think you're likely to see energy, which is weight has gone from low single digits, you know, to much higher over the course of the last six to nine months or so. I I think you probably see that come back in. And I think a lot of the forces that caused those five or six big names to dominate pre-pandemic and then also during the pandemic, you know, I expect them to kind of be in full effect. I also expect them to kind of get their deflationary forces or mojo back, if you will, once we have the pandemic in the rearview mirror. But that's why I think the QQQ is interesting because those five or six names make up, like I said, 40% or so, and then you're gonna get dozens of stocks. They're probably good growth companies that have had their valuations correct that could double and then double again from there. Mm -hmm. So that's the way I'm thinking about it on an intermediate term basis. So, hey, maybe you can uh, tweet out the picture of that fish because it was a <laughs> beauty there. It was Liz. a monster. Um, I was yeah. so tired. I mean, we have a full video of me reeling the entire thing. How long thing did it in. take? How long it did only it take? lasted like three or five minutes, but 
yeah. the way I felt afterwards, it was like it lasted for an hour and a half. I have yeah, never been a, so tired before. That's a good core workout, I suspect there. It was um, amazing. Well, I, I, listen, I also think what you were, your, your point about, um, if they could throw that slide up again about the rallies over the last couple of months, that's that's kind of really interesting. And what you're saying in that last one is, is that correlations went much higher, right? There was less dispersion yeah. um, in that. And that might also have something to do with earnings season in that middle period, you know what I mean? Where you had um, a lot of companies really get, you know, just get actually bludgeoned on disappointing results or so. But I'd also mention that that like a salesforce.com which reported a good quarter good guidance the stock had been down you know close to 50 percent leading into that print you know it's up about 20 percent still if you look at that thing though even that 20 percent rally is not that substantial so we still got a lot of we still got a lot of ways to go here um you know i know that for the most part we feel like earnings are over they still keep coming out i like kind of looking at earnings in the off cycle because it gives me a sense of sentiment like what investors are really kind of focused on now once the major themes have been set in place here tonight after the close you know a company called crowdstrike this is a cybersecurity uh, SaaS name that's going to report here and again this stock just in the fall was making all-time highs it was up from uh, below 50 um, or just 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 below 50 during the throes of the pandemic as high as 280 or so last fall so the thing got nearly cut in half here it's had a nice little bounce implied move is big in this one here but this thing still trades at a very fat uh, price to sales and I'm just curious without opining on the name you know, this would be one, for instance, if they were to miss and guide down at 18 times this year's sales, and it's an unprofitable company on a gap basis, you'd say this thing should correct. I'm just curious how you're still thinking about some of those valuation metrics as you're thinking about high growth areas that might still be unprofitable on a gap basis, Liz. Well, here's what I would say about just high valuation stocks in general or high growth yeah. stocks in general. Wait until after the earnings report and after you have information on guidance to make any moves. If you're going to buy it, wait till after it's over. But this one in particular, if you think about the theme, and I, I talked about this before on Market Call, this is an opportunity in time to buy themes on sale. But if you're going to buy a theme that's on sale, you have to intend to hold it until that theme actually comes to fruition, right? So this theme is about cybersecurity. I don't think that theme is going anywhere anytime soon. If anything, it's getting stronger and it's going to have more demand as time goes on. So I think this is an opportunity to buy some things in the theme that are on sale, but you have to have the intention to hold it. I'm going to say for two to five years until you actually see some good pr price appreciation on it and you feel like you got it right. Yeah. All right. That makes sense. All right. Let's talk about RH. This is restoration hardware. And again, consumer discretionary, but also a name that was very kind of caught up in a lot of those migratory trends that we saw during the pandemic, this kind of housing boom that we saw, low rates too. We saw a lot of people moving out of the cities into homes and furnishing them. And look at that move from the lows uh, during the pandemic. It's, it's pretty extraordinary. Traded nearly $700, you know, last summer or so, traded above that and traded as low just last week um, at 236 bucks. So it's had a really nice bounce. They report after the close today. This is one that I find kind of interesting because if you look at this three-year chart, it's basically round trip that entire move here. And it looks mm -hmm. a bit overdone. So for a company that's trading about 11 times earnings with a good balance sheet, um, you know, the valuation, again, is just something fairly reasonable, unless you think that that pull forward or housing's about to turn or so, you know, this one seems kind of interesting. We know that the CEO on the last call uh, made a few comments here that I think it got a lot of investors kind of uh, tweaked a little bit here. So this will be interesting to see what they guide to what the tone of the conference call is by the CEO and how investors react. Again, I'll just throw this in that kind of consumer discretionary sort of bucket. And yeah, but you know, thoughts there, Liz, on consumer discretionary. Well, I'll tell you, I just made a reservation at the restoration hardware rooftop that's in oh, the nice. packing district. I'm not going to walk out with a sofa, but, <laughs> but, I'll, but I'll be there for drinks and food. Um, look, I think that this one, I don't think it deserved to be where it was at above 700, yeah. but if you just think about the group as a whole, you, you actually have to start parsing these out into smaller groups. And I would call this more of a luxury segment in that particular industry group. The luxury consumer tends to hold up better or at least doesn't turn until much later in the cycle than the lower level consumer. So this one I think is probably a little bit overdone and anything that's done a big round trip like that that would fall into the luxury category and consumer discretionary, I think this is probably a good entry point and there should be a little pop in the second half of the year. 
Yeah, no, so it'll be interesting to see just in the market that seems like it was, it's just squeezing a little bit. So the stories that have been beaten down or high, heavily shorted or that sort of thing, they're kind of, they're kind of, um, they just look like they want to rip here a little bit. And, you know, sometimes as a trader, it makes sense to just kind of let them breathe. You don't want to step yeah. in front of this sort of stuff. So um, that's why I keep kind of looking at some of these inputs. All right, well, that is it. We miss Guy Dami. He'll be back with us uh, on Monday with me and he'll be back with you next uh Thursday, Liz, I really appreciate all your commentary here. Um, listen, this market call was brought to you by FactSet and SoFi. You know that. SoFi, you get your money right all in one app. Um, but we really appreciate their support. We appreciate uh, Open Exchange for powering this program, bringing it to you live over the Twitter, over at o Open Exchange TV, and obviously uh, YouTube Live. So thank you very much. We will be back here on Monday with Market Call. Liz, thanks a lot. Have a great weekend. Bye, everybody. Thanks.